All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. So get excited. Today is your last real lecture for this class. And there's only one more actual class before the final. So come Friday, make sure you send me your review questions. And there may be some special guests, particularly of the slithery and scaly kind. So I've been promising it all semester I wasn't going to go without at least bringing some in. Um, looks like we'll at least have some frogs, some salamanders, at least one snake, and maybe a tortoise as well. So it should be fun. Potentially. So the frogs will be a little bit suspect just because they're frogs and they have really sensitive skin. But uh, the person that's bringing the snake and the tortoise, that's not my call. So I'll let her make that decision. So, but, but just some stuff to keep in mind as always. Um, quiz 14 is due on Sunday, as usual. Last quiz, so take advantage of it. Again, it should be pretty straightforward. Most of the stuff that we've talked about this week has not been crazy. Connecting with biology three is due today. About half of y'all have already turned it in and had it graded, which, you know, great. Um, for the other half of you, make sure you turn it in. It's 5% of your grade. And it literally takes 20 minutes to do. Don't just sit there and waste time or waste your points for it. Um, your final exam, again, is gonna be taking place next Friday, 10 a.m., same lecture hall at least. So not quite the same time, but same lecture hall. Um, you'll have about, I, I anticipate you'll probably only need about 60 minutes to take it. Honestly, you'll probably be all out of here by like 40 minutes in. Um, again, 40 questions, just like last time. There are questions that pull from those two videos that are posted on web courses. So just be sure to watch them. They're not long. Watch them at double speed. You probably won't miss much. Um, and finally, the extra credit is due this Friday. So if you want to do the extra credit, you need to make sure you've got your, your organism picked out and get it turned in by Friday. So does anybody have any questions? Fantastic. So I'm going to be, I'm a little out of it today, so bear with me. Um, slow me down if I go a little bit too fast as always. And of course, if you have questions, this is going to be a little bit more informal today than it would be normally. Um, another thing to keep in mind with today's lecture is it's two, technically two little mini lectures, um, and each one kind of covers on some interesting aspects of Florida in particular, since you are taking a class on biology in Florida, I just want to highlight some things. So the first thing we're going to get started with is just a general understanding of Florida natural history. So for context, when you hear the term natural history, what that's generally referring to is anytime you're talking about the geological, the uh, botanical, the wildlife of an area, and kind of telling the story of that land, if you will. Um, oftentimes, it, it can be kind of uh, a little bit of a gray area, whether or not you include human inhabitants in that, but especially nowadays when you've got um, at least 400 years of European colonization, plus, you know, hundreds and thousands of years of Native Americans cultivating the land, it is important to talk about Kind of that human element in a lot of this stuff as well. Now, Florida ecosystems live and die by two things fire and water. So, as you've noticed here in central Florida, we have a pretty, sh or a pretty shallow water table. You dig down a couple inches and you might be running into actual water just sitting below you. And in fact, most of our water comes from either springs or uh, the large Florida aquifer that sits below about 50, 60 feet below us. Um, and it runs pretty much from the north end of the state all the way down towards the Everglades. And the fire itself is what drives a lot of the plant communities. And if you're driving the, what shapes the plant community, you're pretty much going to influence everything else, right? Now, fire specifically drives those upland plant communities, which ultimately drives that community composition. So, for instance, if you've got really fire tolerant species like the bushy blue stems that a lot of y'all saw, a lot of the uh, Leon Leonia bushes and that kind of stuff, as well as, of course, longleaf pine itself, uh, all of that's going to influence what kind of other critters can live there. And again, back to our whole white or high water table situation, we have a number of very unique aquatic habitats. And because of just how weird our geography is, 
very small shifts in elevation can cause ma major dramatic effects on the actual ability to hold water in particular areas and all that kind of fun stuff. So specifically, there's a great example of this um, that I showed during the Arboretum video where I'm sitting in a pond basin and there's water around me and I look up and about 50 feet away from me, you can literally see just where there's a slight increase in elevation, maybe like two to three inches. And all of a sudden, all the plants are completely different. And you see that pretty consistently. Now, there's a number of major upland habitats in Florida, but they all kind of come back to the general theme of longleaf pine ecosystems. These can be very dry, but have the ability to have some sort of music or some sort of wet qualities to them, where you can have a little bit more wet soil. And often these have open canopy of ponds associated with them. Now, what that means is basically it's just a big open space that will perennially fill up and dry down over the course of the year. And as a result, it's going to keep all your big trees out of it, but a lot of your smaller stuff can go in and use it. So grasses and sedges and things like that. Ultimately, these ecosystems completely depend on fire, specifically because a lot of these plants will have their life cycles tied around to basically being able to germinate post um, a fire coming through. For instance, you have ceratmus cones on the longleaf pine and slash pine, which basically means that that cone will stay completely sealed until it's heat treated. In other words, the sap won't break its molecular bonds until it's gotten really hot. And that's when the seeds are going to actually be able to come out and go into the, the ground and actually grow up into a tree. What's kind of unfortunate about the situation is about 97% of longleaf pine ecosystems have been completely lost over the last 100 years, if not probably going back a little bit farther. Where we went from about 100 million acres that stretched from South Florida all the way up until Virginia, and now those are isolated little pockets in Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, what have you. Here you can see great examples of what this will actually look like. We have these big, tall, longleaf pines with a lot of a pretty open understory. In fact, a lot of the Europeans when they first got here kind of described it as a manicured garden. And again, that's that whole fire, the concept of fire doing a really heavily controlled burn through here that kind of keeps everything from growing up super consistently. Additionally, what's kind of really interesting about long time particular is you'll notice it kind of has long little short stem with a giant little puff of needles. This is a tree coming out of what they call the grass stage, where for the first three to five years of its life, it's going to just exist as that little puff of needles on the ground. And finally, and what that does is it allows it to build up time and resources and put that into its root structure. So that way, when it's ready to, you know, become an adult tree, it has all those kind of things already set up and ready to go. And it can grow really, really quickly after that. Now, in a lot of these ecosystems, natural fire is required, but it's not always practical. And so thus you need something called prescribed fire in order to keep that fire on the landscape and maintain these very similar patterns that we see. Specifically, we often use controlled burns, which have a lot of different uh, beneficial outcomes. First and foremost is it helps prevent much larger wildfires. One of the things that we've learned over the last 100 years or so is that smoky wasn't always right. By having small, contained, controlled fires consistently, you don't let that, fill, that fuel of all those pine needles and leaves and stuff build up over time. And so that way, when a fire does actually come through, it'll rip right through that area and just completely decimate everything. Additionally, it's going to provide that necessary disturbance to kind of keep resetting the clock on reaching that climax community. Is ultimately, technically, for longleaf pine ecosystems, it's really scrubby oaks that are ultimately going to be what ultimately dominates it without that fire. And they're just a pain to get through. They're just not fun to deal with. And finally, that's going to help maintain that plant diversity. By introducing that disturbance every now and then, it creates patchiness. And that patchiness allows for you know, plants that do really well one year post-fire, or two years post-fire, or three years post-fire. And by dividing up the land into these different burn units, and here's actually an example from UCF's Arboretum, you can kind of plan exactly how and when it makes the most sense to have fire on the landscape. 
And that way you're not completely doing it for every single plot of land, every single acre, every year. So that's just not practical. So it's kind of sketchy, but a little bit fun. Basically you walk out there with this grip torch um, and it takes a lot of training. Like it's a two week long course that you usually have to take and be able to do things like run with a fully loaded pack on about hundred pounds for four miles because they don't want to take the chance to get out there and get you know, trapped behind the line and die. Because this happens all the time, actually. Um, I had a buddy of mine that I went to undergrad with that actually died in one of these fires out in Utah during one of the, the big uh, massive wildfire spreads that happened in like 2018, 2017 or so. But it's also kind of complicated. Now, um, I'll try to post, there's a really cool video that I really encourage y'all to look for that UCF did where they actually talk about how they manage fire on the landscape at the Arboretum. That's really cool. Definitely take the uh, time to look at it. Now kind of the intermediary between your longleaf pine and your much more drier habitat is the scrub system. Now these are much more dry than those longleaf pine savannas and often have what we call barren grass, where it's just sand or lichen growing over sand itself. This is a, a very interesting habitat because it's home to the only endemic bird species here in Florida. And we'll talk about what that species is here in a little bit. So in other words, there's five to 600 different birds that may be in Florida at any one given species of birds that may be in Florida at any one given time. Only one of them only resides in Florida. And additionally, what's kind of interesting is, and you'll see this better here, is most of these trees are the short scrubby oaks and uh, maples and things like that. Again, a lot more uh, dry tolerant species that can handle being, you know, without water for a long time. We can also have this area called the dry pyramids which are usually open dry grasslands with little to no tree cover whatsoever. This is basically where you've got fire constantly going, at least historically every year or so. And it kept the larger trees from being able to really establish. This is historically where we would have had bison grazing pre-1800. I don't think many of y'all realize that we have bison here in Florida and we still technically do. Um, it's just a much smaller population. It's been reintroduced into one of our state parks. And a great example of this ecosystem is if you go just south of Daneville, there's a huge state park called Payne's Prairie. It's worth the time to just go out and hike it. It's really cool. Here you can actually see some of the vistas from this. This is big, wide open grassy areas. It does tend to get a little wet in some of these areas, but for the most part, there's no trees whatsoever. But of course, how can you not love the bison itself? They're kind of cute. So let's get into some of the aquatic habitats here. Now, probably the most important one when it comes to Florida, at least in where we we're at, are these ephemeral habitats or cypress zones. Now, these are two separate things, um, but they do often kind of interact very similarly. And ultimately, the main component about these wetlands is that they dry down every year, or at least every other year. In other words, there's about somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six months out of the year, these ponds are completely dry and they're just a shallow basin with nothing in it. And then you go into our rainy season, which is usually during the summer. It rains a lot. All the, ta all the frogs will come in, breed in there. Their offspring will you know, metamorphose and then leave and the pond dries down. And what that allows them to do is avoid a lot of pressure from fish. And usually the only fish you're gonna find in these things are things like mosquito fish, which are super tiny and often can be transported through uh, birds accidentally, not killing all of them when they try to eat them, that kind of stuff. And again, what's really cool about these kinds of habitats is they're close to just a number of different frog species and salamander species, um, including the protected striped newt, as well as the protected Florida gorilla frog. And unfortunately, these are disappearing as they're often used for other things. Say for instance, if you're trying to convert a landscape to just residential shopping or something like that, you're gonna turn it into a much larger retention pond. It's gonna hold water much more consistently. And as a result, things like 
um, some of the tilapia and the bluegill and that kind of stuff can then persist in those ponds now, as well as um, if you're talking about more agricultural situations, you'll have, often see these get dug out and used for water and cattle. And here you can actually see kind of what it looks like during the wet cycles versus the dry cycles. And not all, and it's kind of hard to see on the picture, but um, you'll often have a lot of little slight gradients in the actual topography itself. This creates a lot of variation. And, you know, variation is a good thing if you want to maintain a lot of diversity, right? Here's what it would actually look like during the middle of the summer, or right before the middle of the summer before it gets all the rain. Where it's just going to be completely dry, full plant life. But if you look, you can still see that slight step down. And that's how you can tell that there is a pond usually there at some point. Now, Florida also has some other really cool aquatic habitats. And a lot of those are based around the Florida aquifer. Obviously, you know, not a whole lot of things can go live you know, deep underground for, you know, hundreds of years, but where the water comes out, it forms these natural springs, which are the lifeblood of a lot of not only recreation, which drove tourism in Florida for like 100 years, but it also is very essential for things like manatees, which will come into these spring watersheds so that way they can stay warm during the winter when it's too cold out in the ocean. And again, these are often turned into tourist traps. Kiowa Springs is a great example. Uh, Silver Springs, up until about 10 years ago, even had a water park in theirs. But they're, they're just kind of interesting to check out. Now, if you haven't been to one, I highly encourage it. I think this is Blue Springs, which is about an hour north of Orlando. Right now, you can't actually go swimming in it because there are currently about 100 manatees all kind of congregated right in here. It's absolutely incredible to see. It's a little graphic because they beat up on each other and they meet with each other, but it's really cool to check out if you can. Now we can't talk about Florida, but talking about probably one of its most famous aquatic habitats. And this can be subdivided into a million other little things, but we'll just call it the Florida Everglades for simplicity's sake. And you hear this term thrown around a river of grass. What that basically means is you have a very shallow, large floodplain that's often thousands or hundreds of miles across. And what happens is, is the water's just moving so slowly and so gradually, ultimately out to the Gulf of Mexico, that you basically can't even tell anymore. But ultimately it starts in Lake, Cassette, or, uh, Lake Okeechobee and just kind of works its way down south. And a lot of this area is full of a lot of just really cool endemic species that you're only going to find in the Everglades. Now, unfortunately, and there's a great book that kind of documents some of these changes called The Swamp, but the hydrology itself has been heavily damaged, primarily due to the sugarcane agriculture industry on the west side of the Everglades, as well as just development near Miami itself. And again, it's home to numerous protected species, everything from uh, the different, uh, the snail kites, the uh, American crocodile, manatees, all that kind of fun stuff there. If you haven't been to the Everglades, you need to go at least sometime in your life while you're in the state. And here's what I'm talking about with the big river of grass, where if you were down in this, you wouldn't really be able to see any kind of patterns. But when you go up, you know, out on some of these lookout towers, say for instance, in the actual Everglades National Park, you can see this just slow meandering push of water, slowly moving back out. Now, finally, once all that water gets out of the state, either through rivers or through the other place itself, you come into the estuaries and the mangroves. These are primarily saltwater habitats that are present all along Florida's coast and are incredibly important for everything from uh, storm prevention, where it will actually help break up the storm and cause us not to be completely destroyed every time we get a hurricane, as well as it's an incredibly useful resource for uh, a lot of different species of fish that'll use this as a nursery, particularly a lot of the big sports fish like redfish or um, snook, tarpon, a lot of those just classic things that people spend thousands and thousands of dollars to come down and fish for. This is the kind of habitat that they're looking for. As well as even sharks. We had a project here on campus not too long ago where somebody, or a grad student was tagging and monitoring hammerheads as they moved in and out of these situations. 
so they could see where they were giving birth and how many and all that kind of fun stuff. And ultimately, these are primarily built on the backs of oysters and mangrove trees. Now, oysters are disappearing due to overharvesting and just pollution, but we are, if you haven't seen it already, UCF has like one of the strongest programs for uh, oyster bed re uh, restoration in the country. Um, as particularly in Brevard County, there's a lot of really cool stuff that we're doing over there um, as a direct result of basically people going out, collecting the shells from a lot of these seafood restaurants, and then making artificial oyster mats that can then be put back on the landscape and allow the uh, little juvenile oysters to grow up in that. It's really cool. But again, you can actually see what this would look like in practice. Again, those, those beautiful mangrove trees that have those really interesting root structures that allow them to stay in that, that primarily aquatic soil, as well as just these giant open flood plants here, uh, where you probably have this, this entire thing just full of oysters. Now, we can't talk about Florida without talking about some of the cool species that are here. So we do have to highlight at least a couple that you should be familiar with if you live in the state, both from your own safety as well as just they're cool. And I won't spend too much time on this because we've harped on it enough, but everybody loves to go for us. They're cute. They also try to kill each other, but you know, they're fun. And again, the big important thing about them is they are keystone species that their burrows are often used to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 different species of animals and insects and all that kind of fun stuff. And that allows for that refuge to exist during those fire uh, system in those fire systems. Now I kind of alluded to this earlier. We also have something called the scrub jay, the Florida scrub jay. This is the only endemic bird found here in Florida. In other words, this bird is found nowhere else. It literally is just isolated to these small little scrub communities. They form unique family groups where siblings will actually help to raise younger siblings. And they've been well documented to have different personalities where some are more outgoing, where some are much more reserved. And you can actually train them. And the way they've learned a lot of this stuff is by basically going out there with peanuts and having the animals come and interact with researchers in the wild. A uh, great population is found at the R12 Biological Station. But if you live out more towards Brevard County, I really recommend checking out a place called Crookshanks like the Kirkshanks Wildlife Preserve or something like that. You can literally just go out there and these things will swarm you. And they're really cool because they are a federally protected species. So don't take pictures of them per se with you touching them, but they're neat. Um, additionally, they're again, reliant on that scrub ecosystem where they can't have too many big trees, but they can't have no trees whatsoever. And so they need those like small scrubby oaks and things to be able to persist. And of course, how can you not talk about this really cool critter? Uh, this is the Florida panther. They're originally widespread throughout most of Florida and actually ranged up into Georgia, South Carolina, Texas, that kind of thing. Um, but they're now only found in South Florida near the Everglades, just because that's the one last bit of habitat that they can survive in. Population size is incredibly low. And as a result, um, not only are they protected by the Endangered Species Act, the ESA, but they are um, incredibly genetically bottlenecked. And what that means is their genetic diversity is so poor that it's, you know, they've been breeding with cousins on cousins on cousins for the last hundred years, right? It's not exactly good for your genes. And so a lot of the males up until the last 10 to 15 years or so where they brought in new genetics had to have really bad crooked tails and cow licks and their testes didn't descend properly. And it was basically gonna kill the species off. So it, it, it's gotten better, but it's, it's taken some time. And another endangered species I have to highlight, of course, our wonderful Florida manatee. If y'all haven't heard, this is actually one of the worst years for Florida manatees in the last, say, 30 years, where normally the population increases by about 100 to 200 every year. This year, we've had 10,000 deaths as a direct result that were considered unnatural or, un, or not unusual deaths is the word I'm looking for. What has been happening is that the seagrass beds that normally exist out kind of in between the springs itself and their aquatic ocean going habitat just got completely wiped out this year. And as a result, these skinny kind of malnaturous uh, manatees were coming out of the springs 
They had no food and they ended up dying off from hunger. Now keep in mind when you see a manatee, that's not a lot of fat. Most of it's actually bone and um, their actual intestinal organs. And the reason for that is they, they eat grass. They're kind of like a cow. They need so much space to be able to process all that grass material. And so there's not a whole lot of fat on them. So when things don't work out in their favor, it doesn't end very well, very quickly. And again, they are protected under ESA. Um, the population did seem to be increasing until this year. Now, I saw a couple of y'all see some of these critters, but I do want to highlight them just because you should be careful with them here in Florida and try not to get bit. But we should talk about the venomous species. Now there's six of these that are in the state of Florida all together, but five of them are only found here in Central Florida. Probably the most important one to talk about is the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. They can get upwards of seven feet long and weigh like 10 to 15 pounds, which is pretty hefty for a snake. Um, they're pretty distinct because they have this classic diamond shape pattern that runs all the way down the back. Of course, hard to miss a beautiful day. Uh, they are really important, but in the sense that they can help, you know, get rid of pests and are very good at kind of controlling small mammal populations. But they can be dangerous if you piss them off. So I really highly recommend to not be a statistic like I am and try not to mess with them. Because unfortunately, the, if you actually look at the numbers, the individuals that are most likely to get bit are the hold my beer crowd. Where basically you have you know, young males between the ages of 16 to 23, which fit me perfectly, often um, drinking some sort of substance or smoking some sort of substance and decide, look at me, I'm a badass, I can go pick one of those up. Usually doesn't end very well. Um, so just keep that in mind. But there are also other species of rattlesnakes here in Central Florida. You have the pygmy rattlesnake, which is really pretty. They can have this just beautiful, almost bluish gray pattern to them. Um, and up into the Carolinas, it can be dark red, which is really pretty. For the smallest bit of a snake, um, their bite's not really that bad, honestly. I've had a couple friends that have gotten bit by them. They never needed the anti venom and did okay. Oh, just go to the hospital. Um, and bites are just rarely fatal for this species, which is really not that important. Now, probably the most dangerous, dangerous uh, venomous snake that we have, at least from a venom perspective, is the eastern coral snake, which does have a very similar looking non-venomous snake, actually two different species of non-venomous snakes that try to match the species. Um, but what's kind of interesting about them is they're most closely related to things like cobras, black mambas, um, some of the crazy elapids from Australia that'll kill you in like an hour. Very similar kind of venom, just on a much more diluted form. And oftentimes, they take a lot to get you to get them to bite them. Uh, a great story I heard was um, there was an individual that had caught one that had been sitting there messing with it for literally a day and a half because he thought it was a scarlet king snake, uh, which is one of those non-venomous uh, mimics. And finally, it bit him after about a day and a half of just being constantly prodded and poked around before he was going to give it to his kid. Um, and he described it as the weirdest sensation. Because basically, what it does is it shuts down all of your nerves. And you can basically feel the loss of all of his sensations from his arm slowly creeping up. By the time he got the anti-venom, it had gotten way up almost a year. And granted, this is about, about two, three hours later. And you can start feeling it come back down. But as it come back to, came back down, it just released this immense amount of pain. So it's really nasty stuff if you do get bit, but it's pretty hard to. Uh, then you have the Florida cottonmouth or the uh, water moccasin. Not all water snakes are water moccasins. They're not all venomous. But this one clearly is. What you often can tell is if a snake will sit open like that and leave open its mouth like that, it's probably a cotton mouth, uh, at least compared to other water snakes. Primarily going to feed on things like fish and frogs and small mammals. The bite's not that bad, but again, they do have a lot of things that look very similar to it. Now, these two species aren't really found here in Central Florida. They tend to be much more North Florida species, but you have the cottonhead, which has a really pretty, very fish-shaped pattern all across the back. 
they're closely related to the cotton mouse itself. They're kind of like a, a real quick branch before you get to the actual proper rattlesnakes. And oftentimes, things like copperheads and cotton mouse will have this really bright yellow tail that they'll wiggle just like a, a rattlesnake would and use that to try to distract and concern other things. And of course, the timber rattlesnake, which does look very different um, from a eastern diamondback, but it's about the same size. And it's probably the species that has the most bites of anywhere in North America. Um, the easy way to tell them apart from eastern diamondback is if you look, they have the chevron pattern, so it kind of looks like that, instead of the just true diamond all the way down. As always, you can see a lot of these different species at the Arboretum, take advantage of it. So when we're talking about Central Florida and Florida in general, it's kind of hard not to talk about our next topic, which is invasion ecology. In other words, how does the system handle new species arriving into that situation? Let's kind of start with some basic definitions here. So invasive species versus introduced species slash non-native species, it's kind of bandied around a lot. And it's important to know the difference because they mean very different things. So an invasive species is a non-native species that's introduced to an area that's causing damage directly to that native ecosystem. Whereas that introduced species like non-native species, this species has been added to an area that does not appear to be negatively impacting native populations. Now keep in mind, this kind of occurs on a gradient. So it's really kind of hard to necessarily say you're definitively a just introduced species and not an invasive species. So oftentimes you just kind of hear the term invasive species, so it's a little bit easier just to kind of definitively say more than likely this thing is having a bad effect. Now, North America has the most amount of introduced species compared to anywhere else in the world, although Asia in particular is increasing rather quickly. We have roughly 16, there are 6,600 different species that have been introduced since the arrival of the Europeans in the 1400s with around 200 of those species arriving just between the last, between 1980 and 1993. So it's massively increasing every year. Now, while Hawaii is the worst hit state, and that's just because it's a very isolated spot, pretty easy to accidentally introduce things to it, Florida is one of the worst as well. We have over 2,000 established invasive species here in Florida and in the Gulf Coast in general, with an additional 25,000 plants that are in cultivation with which are not included. And here you can kind of see some classic examples of these species. Now, in particular in the US, invasive mammals and plants are the most prolific. Things like the black rat, the Norwegian rat, and domestic cats have absolutely decimated entire ecosystems. So please make sure you keep your cat inside. As well as you get things like kudzu, Brazilian pepper, Japanese pine and fern. A lot of these ornamentals that got released into the wild and have now taken over entire stands of trees. Now here in Florida, we're a little bit different in that we have a higher proportion of invasive reptiles and amphibians. Things like the Cuban tree frog, the cane toad, or the Burmese python. Ultimately, invasive species have huge impacts, causing millions of damage to forests and crops, as well as causing declines in protected species like this Burmese python eating our Florida key larger wood rat. But there's also other effects too. Things like invasives competing with or predating native species. Things like brown anoles will often eat green anoles. Uh, Burmese pythons will eat a lot of other different species. And feral cats kill about everything they can find, even if they don't eat it. As well as invasive species can often serve as disease reservoirs. In other words, they can sit out there, amplify things, make it much worse for the native species that are already there. So how exactly are they getting here? Oh man, sorry, hang on a second. There's two kind of primary routes. You have accidental introductions and intentional introductions. Intentional introductions include things like failed biological controls, which a great example of this is the cane toads or some of the ornamental introductions as well as accidental introductions, which include travel, trade, uh, parasites from ornamental species, ballast water, unprocessed natural products, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'll be back in just a minute. My stomach is killing me for whatever reason. 